Well, I am Shelby Leggett. I am the chair of the program development committee for the Clay Mineral Society this year. And we have started a new series called the Clay Minar Series. And we will be presenting uh, these series every month or so for the next, uh, over the next couple of years. And our first seminar is going to be given by Joe Stuckey and Kevin Murphy, who are the editor and chief and managing editor of Clays and Clay Minerals, the journal that is put out by the Clay Mineral Society. Um, I would like to remind everyone to please keep your microphones muted during the presentation. And then we will have time for questions after the presentation is ended. Um, without Further ado, uh, Joe and Kevin, if you would like to start your presentation, please. Sure. Thanks very much, Shelby, um, and and welcome everybody. All right, I'm going to start sharing my screen, and uh, I will introduce uh, myself and Joe uh, uh, to follow up on what Shelby just said. Then we'll get into it. I'm going to take the first part of the presentation, and then Joe will will take over. Okay. So here we go. Um, f first and foremost, I think. Uh, this is a sort of a tricky presentation to try and present, and it's tricky because um, everybody who comes on a on a, a conference call or webinar like this comes with a different amount of experience um, and and a different set of skills. So what we're trying to do is is to give a, a presentation which will help as many of you as possible. Um, we we certainly think that uh, there's something in here for everybody. Um, the skills that we're, we're, we're trying to pass on today hopefully will be relevant for, for our journal, but also for any other journals that you, uh, you work on and, and may be interested in submitting manuscripts to. Um, Joe has been editor of Clays and Clay Minerals for um, 15, 15, year, 15 years, mm -hmm. yeah, and, and I've been involved in publishing for 30-something for, uh, years um, back in the days when uh, we did our manuscript tracking with a set of index cards, we did our correspondence with a, a typewriter, and, uh, and, and the best friend we had was the postman delivering um, packages from, from authors and reviewers around the world. It, it's, it's obviously quite different uh, nowadays. The journal has been published continuously since 1952. Uh, we're in volume 72 this year, 355 issues uh, up until October 23, 41,000 pages, 4,608 papers. So we come with a fair amount of experience to today's presentation, I think it's fair to say. Um, these are some of the editors that have worked on the journal. Not not that many over the period, I'm sure you'll agree. Uh, and I see Joe bottom right there, but also the others, Derek Bain, his immediate predecessor, and Mike Valble, who who stood in for a piece of of Joe's term while Joe was uh, abroad uh, uh, on another project. Uh, Steve Guggenheim, another person many of you will recognise there. So I thought we'd start off with a bit of some of the vital statistics about the journal because these things are relevant to you as you think about submitting to the journal. If you're thinking of submitting and writing a paper, you need to know what kind of a journal it is you're, you're submitting to. So in 2022, uh, the average time from first submission to first decision was 37 days. And that includes uh, from the day of submission, the day you put your manuscript into editorial manager, Somebody has to check it to make sure that it's appropriate for peer review, and we'll come back to that later. Then goes to the editor-in-chief, who sends it to an associate editor, who sends it to reviewers, who send it back to the associate editor, who give it back to the editor-in-chief, who then corresponds with the authors. That's an awful lot of steps in 37 days. We work really hard at keeping that uh, number of days to a minimum. Um, but that, that's where we are right about now. At the other end of the process, as soon as your manuscript is accepted, we spend about six weeks in, in production matters, copy editing, typesetting, proofreading, and the business of getting your manuscript online. In the meantime, accepted manuscripts are published, of course, uh, in, in uh, author accepted form, but it takes that amount of time to, to prepare it. And in between the two of those phases, from first decision until acceptance, we have perhaps a round of revision, perhaps two, perhaps more. And that really depends on the quality of the, the work that was submitted initially. Um, 70,000 people downloaded material from Clays and Clay Minerals during 2022. That's, that just happens to be the most recent one for which we have data. Um, it's a significant audience size. And we'll come back to that in a moment as well. Our impact factor is 2.2, um, most recent one announced in June 2023. 
um, 199 papers were submitted uh, during calendar year 2022, and we had an acceptance rate of about 32%. Um, clearly, manuscripts are coming in all over the time and going out all of the time to be reviewed. So, so it's difficult to get an exact pin on how many of every single paper are accepted. But it's about somewhere between 30 and 40 percent in any given year. Uh, for us, that's the most significant measure of quality we can offer you as an author. Um, we, we look really hard at the quality of everything that is submitted and we're, we're discerning about what we accept. And, and that's why we've got that big word quality written there on that slide. Um, I just wanted to show you this. This comes from our current publisher, Springer, and it shows that people in 7,000 libraries around the world have access to clays and clay minerals at the moment. Um, we've tried to make the journal as widely available as we possibly can. Um, many of you will know we're about to switch to Cambridge University Press for the start of from the start of 2024. And we hope that we will have a similar number of customers who can access the content um, going forward. For us, it's it's really critical. And was one of the main reasons for us joining in with a, a commercial partner in the first place. So all of that said, what, what are the things I should consider if, I'm, if I've got a manuscript in mind, I think I'm ready to, to start thinking about publishing it, which journal should I choose? So I think for us, the, the most important thing to say is relevance. Your particular piece of work, um, have other paper, papers been published in our journal on that topic before? If they haven't, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you shouldn't publish with us, but I think it's an important rule of thumb to say, well, is there an audience for my type of science in this journal? And that's, that's key. And how big is the audience? You know, you can have a very niche journal with a very tiny audience, but it might just be the right journal for your content. Um, as I said, our, our journal has access from 7,000 libraries. So we hope that we can provide an audience almost anywhere and almost any subject within our clay science. Um, the quality of the material published, I've already mentioned the rejection rate that we use. Um, but the question for you is, are you and your colleagues impressed by the material published in the journal? Um, the other material, not, not, not your own paper, but the other papers that you see, I think that's really important. Does does our journal impress you? That That's essentially what the question you have to ask yourself. Uh, I've already talked about the quality of the peer review. We We insist on three reviews for every single paper that is published. And we give those reviewers time to carry out a quality peer review. We know that impact factor is important to many scientists um, and we work as, as hard as we can to get the highest impact factor we can. There are many things at play in the calculation of impact factors and in the generation of impact factors. Um, and for us, the quality of our peer review, our relationship with the authors, and the quality which we, with which we produce the content is, is also very important. Uh, but be aware that we do focus on impact factor and it is important to us because it's important to you. And one other question you might want to ask yourself is, you know, is the fact that the journal is a commercial journal or published on behalf of a learned society important? Is, is, that, is that important to you? And, and I ask that question because um, if you're publishing your paper in a learned society, the, the funds, the money that is generated by the journal is pumped back into uh, the learned society. So we give out student grants um, and, and, and we, we organize conferences and we serve the community. Um, commercial journals don't necessarily do that, of course. And, and I think that's, from, from our perspective, that's an important point to keep in mind. Uh, other, other factors, uh, I, I mentioned the number of reviews already. Um, in these days, whether you can publish your material open access uh, in a given journal is important. Um, do you have to pay lots of money in order to do that if you want to do that? Um, in Clays and Clay Minerals with, with Cambridge University Press in 2024, we'll be using, a, they, they have in place many transformative agreements, which means that you may already be able to publish open access without additional charge to you or your institute. I think it's really important to keep that in mind because, of course, if your material is open access, anybody in the world can read it anywhere. Um, 
Joe and I take particular care, as as do the members of our editorial board and our reviewers, with with production. So so, for those of you who might have submitted a paper to our journal, you will have found that we put a lot of work, a lot of effort into getting your presentation right, working with you to get your presentation right. The text, the figures, the tables, everything. Um, I, I told you earlier about the review time that we spent. That's really important. But a key part of the submission to acceptance time is also the amount of time that you as the author take to revise your work. Um, and I think, you know, we, we, we are aware of those statistics and we would like the authors to be aware of them because for us, getting those revisions done well and thoroughly is important, uh, but also getting them done in a timely fashion is important. We're also aware that some of you require publication of your work as part of your thesis. So, so we, we try and focus and have our reviewers and our editorial team focus on getting student work through the system as quickly as we can whilst maintaining the quality of the process. So you've decided which journal you're going to go for, and, and we hope it's ours, but whatever journal you go for, what are the, what are the simple things that I can get right straight out the, the gap? What, what do I need to know? What do I need to do in order to, to prevent my paper from being sent back to me because at triage stage, because I haven't gotten something quite right? So all of the stuff like title, authors and affiliations, abstracts, keywords, introduction, headings, and, and the reference list. Now, all of that, all of those things, with the possible exception of the abstract and the introduction, are mechanical things that you can get absolutely right. In your title, have you said exactly what this paper is about, as close as you can, with the fewest words possible? Are you trying to claim things in your title that don't actually come through in the paper? And so on. And, and so... If you're, if you're talking about the list of authors, make sure you include everybody that was involved at the outset. It's, it's possible to include people subsequently, but it's more difficult because these things go out and are pre-published online at an early stage, remember. Um, Joe will talk to you about abstracts and introductions and the sorts of things you should have in there. Uh, but from our perspective, getting the, the headings right and focusing on making sure that your reference list is, is accurate is really important. Check notes for guidance about how we want you to present your reference list. Make sure that all of the citations in your text are matched by a reference in the list and that every reference in the list has actually been cited somewhere in the manuscript. And we find that discrepancies occur particularly during revision when, when things are, are moved or are, are taken out. Uh, one of the things that we've always focused on in Clays and Clay Minerals is asking authors to produce a set of artwork at the outset, which is of the highest standard possible. And, and the reason we do that, and we realize that it takes a lot of time to do that, is because you're going to have to do that at some stage anyway, if you plan to publish this paper or this artwork somewhere. So you might as well do that right at the outset, get it right, get it to the standard that's asked for in the notes for guidance. Um, this is one of the things that slows down papers at acceptance stroke production stage more than anything is that the figures aren't quite of the right standard. And we ask that you lay out your tables in accordance with the style that we put in our notes for guidance of authors. And there are other things to be aware of. Again, more mechanical things. Make sure that you follow the nomenclature that's been uh, issued by the International Mineralogical Association and by the International Clay Organization, AEPA. Um, this is particularly important when it comes to, to mineral names um, and, and we ask, because because that, that's, that's an issue that comes up for us in production on a very regular basis. Also suggest that you refer to the Clay Mineral Society publication Glossary of Clay Science, which which is extremely valuable and uh, should be on the desktop of, uh, of everybody who's interested in publishing in clay science, I think. Um, equations and abbreviations, footnotes, and so on. Um, e equations, uh, we ask that everybody produces an equation where variables are italicized, but where where other things are not. So so so, um, if you've got a constant, you, you don't use italics for that. And and manuscripts with um, with equations in them invariably require work by the production staff, and and th that can be reduced or removed by people paying attention to our our notes on that, our guidance on that. For abbreviations, uh, the the first 
occurrence of a term in a paper, you should use the full version of it and then the abbreviated form of it. And that makes it easier for the reader to understand what you're talking about. Seems like a simple point, but actually it doesn't happen in every manuscript we receive. And and we as, as the editorial team are left scratching our heads wondering, well, I wonder what that stands for. Um, and in figures, there are certain things that we should insist on for every every single figure we have. So if a scale is relevant, make sure you include a scale, not magnification, but a scale. The numbering and lettering should be of an appropriate size relative to the figure overall and relative to other numbering and lettering that you might have on the figure. The captions should be accurate uh, the, and the labels should be descriptive and follow the style that you'll find in another version, in other papers, figures in other papers in our journal. Um, most importantly, I think from, from my perspective is if, if you're borrowing material from somebody else's um, figure, if you're adapting it, you must be sure to secure appropriate permission before you come to the journal uh, and, and submit it for publication. So a change of a, of a simple letter does not mean that you've, you've got a brand new figure and you need to make significant change to a figure if it's to become your own. So, so if you think that you might have a question about uh, copyright, please do ask us and we will, we will offer advice on it. But that, that's certainly um, a question that comes up for us sometimes. We also have other backend information in our manuscript, and, and this almost concludes the stuff to do with mechanical operations in, in relation to preparing your manuscript. So who were the people who supported your work? Um, who were the people who uh, helped you? You know, you're, you're, you're in your acknowledgements, all, all of that stuff. You, you can prepare all of that and have that written and, and prepared completely at your very first draft. It doesn't have to be something that's that's added late in the stage where it takes up more time. So now we get to the difficult bit, the actual writing. I suspect the reason why many of you are here this morning. J Joe is going to take over here. He, he will refer extensively to Fred Mumpton's work on this. And, and Fred is a former editor of the uh, of the journal, and he will refer also to the to the scientific method. So I'm going to hand you over to Joe and take you on to the next slide. I'm going to continue to drive the slides on behalf of Joe. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Um, as indicated, I'm Joe Stuckey. I've been the editor since 2008, which uh, I want to say how wonderful it is that we have Kevin Murphy to help uh, with the journal. In fact, even with all other, ma many other matters in the society. So we're very fortunate to have Kevin on board and having been with us for so long. So I express my gratitude to him for all of his efforts. And as you can tell from what he's already said, he's very skilled with this uh, manuscript handling and editorial processes as well as many other things. So, Thank you, Kevin. Sure. As uh, Kevin indicated, um, I will refer to a, an article by Fred Mumpton. Uh, I don't know that any of you knew Fred, but he was a very persnickety editor, as he used that term in that in that uh, manuscript that he published. But he was excellent at um, uh, helping authors know how to write and uh, making the quality of the journal very high. So uh, giving you the reference to that, uh, I invite all of you and encourage you to go and read that manuscript and, um, and to follow his counsel in it. Uh, wherever I've put quotations in, the, in this presentation, they are from Fred's uh, paper. So if you go to the next slide. So the basic principles of writing a manuscript are first, it's really important that you as an author put forth your very best effort. Uh, don't leave it to ed editors and reviewers to make uh, lots of corrections of, of, your, of the writing and so forth, but do your very best. Now we understand that many are not native English speakers and we uh, ma make allowance for that. And so, but we would ask you to do your best. Uh, and know that writing in a foreign language is not the easiest thing to do but do your best that you can do on your own and then solicit the help of colleagues who are, are fluent in English and sometimes even hire a, a professional service 
to review your paper and to help you with the writing. Uh, this will very much improve, um, not only improve the manuscript, but it also increases the possibility of getting good reviews. So um, it's really important, I think, to put forth your very best effort right at the beginning. And a, a phrase that I learned when I was learning how to write was the second point here, which says, write not to be understood, but write not so that you cannot be un misunderstood. So that takes some skill to really focus on it, that you, you're saying exactly what you mean and not allowing for uh, misunderstanding. And another phrase that was taught to me was this in terms of doing your very best effort is you think about what you want to say, think a volume, and then condense that down to just a single page, and then condense that further to just a single line. So think a volume, write a page, and for every page of thine, publish but a single line. I've remembered that phrase from my graduate school days. All right, next slide. Now, one thing that I notice in most manuscripts is the authors will start start out initially just telling, saying, we did this, rather than talking about what the problem was and why they did this. And um, if you've ever written uh, research grant proposals, you understand that you've got to convince a panel to give you money. And when you're trying to convince someone of something, you need to identify a problem that needed to be solved. And once you've identified that problem, then you can introduce your own creativity on how you want to go about solving that problem. And that's where you then create or identify specific objectives that you believe will help solve the problem. Objectives should be written in, for, in terms of measurable quantities. Use, use action words like determine and uh, measure and quantify and so forth. And then talk about what your expected outcomes are. You know, so if you think of a problem, you say, okay, here's the problem. And this is what we intend, intended to do to solve that problem. And this is what we expected would happen. And then you can talk about the measurements that you made. These are the experiments we conducted to test that hypothesis and to meet those objectives. And then um, you can conclude by discussing how well your, uh, your study uh, met those objectives and whether or not the hypotheses you had at the beginning were, were met or were um, upheld. And so this is known, as you all know, is the, is the scientific method. And so we would strongly encourage you to use that approach as you prepare your, your manuscripts, both in the abstract and throughout the paper. Next slide, please. So here would be the general outline. Uh, Kevin's already introduced uh, other parts of the manuscript. But within the body of the, the manuscript, these are the sections that we look for. The abstract, introduction, materials and methods, results, discussion, and the summary and conclusions. And of course, you have keywords, and you have references, and your figures and tables and everything else to go with it. Go on to the next slide. So this is the first point I want to make, and Fred Mumpton made a very excellent point, uh, that the abstract is really the most difficult part of, of a manuscript. Because, um, as he said, it's not for the expert in the subject that you're writing it, but it's for the non-expert who might never read the rest of the paper, but would like to know what it, it's all about. So spend a... a a lot of time working on the abstract. And you may not want to write the abstract until the manuscript is finished. But uh, Fred has some excellent suggestions on how to go about writing the abstract. But it should follow a general pattern of 
problem statement, objectives, hypotheses, and me methods and materials used, and what the findings were and your conclusions. So think of that outline uh, as being the, the format for an abstract. Now the abstract can't go on forever, so you need to limit it to maybe 300 words or so. And you do not cite uh, figures and tables and references in the abstract. Okay, next slide. And here in the introduction is where you convince the reader that the, the problem is real and that uh, a work that's already been done on it has not completely resolved the problem and that your proposed methods and objectives will um, advance the frontiers of clay science toward satisfying or solving that problem. So spend a good effort in the introduction. We expect a full literature review, although not absolutely comprehensive, but it should be uh, not just a very light review. It should cover the, pro the studies that have been done in the past, addressing that topic and that problem, and uh, identifying where the gaps of knowledge are. And uh, as Fred said, if uh, readers cannot grasp why the investigation was conducted in the first place, they may never bother to read about the wonderful results or revolutionary conclusions. Next slide. Uh, this is an important point, and I believe that most of us as authors may gloss over this a little bit, but we really do need to cite original works and give credit to the ones who were the creators of um, certain phenomena or characteristics or processes or identified them. Very often someone will say, well, the, the Montmorillonite has a two-to-one clay structure and they'll cite a 2021 paper. Well, from my point of view, we should go back to the original work that, that um, identified that structure, or certainly something that has a long-standing reputation as being the, the origin of that knowledge. And so give credit to originators of information, not just to someone who may have merely cited the original study. Now, it's okay to cite other studies that have mentioned it, of course, but not to the exclusion of the original work. Um, next slide. Um, materials and methods. I think most people do reasonably well in describing their work, but just keep this principle in mind that a reader should be able to follow in, to to read what you have written about what you did and be able to reproduce it. Now that could be include a combination of the descriptions that you give and also references to more details about methods. So uh, keep that in mind that that's what you're writing it for so the reader can reproduce it if they uh, choose to do so, but also to add credibility to your study that you used the appropriate methods and that, sh that the methods you used would indeed uh, assist you in reaching your objectives. And uh, the methods, uh, and this goes back to your design of your study, uh, you want to be sure that you have covered as, as many possible ways of looking at a problem as you can. Uh, we ask that you, and this is maybe unique to our journal, a little bit is that you give us more details about the manufacturer or the supplier of the equipment, materials, and chemicals that you mentioned. The reason for that, and to give us the location of wh where the, uh, the that manufacturer or supplier was, and the reasons for that is so that we can have some idea of of uh, assessing if there were ever uh, a problem with with a, a batch of chemicals, for example, or something. But it also helps people know, well, where can I go to get that kind of material or equipment if I wanted to reproduce this study or do something similar. So it's very helpful to the reader to um, add as much information as you can about those, those things. 
and uh, as I mentioned before, provide the references of, of published methods that you use. Uh, it's probably usually not the best to just say we use the method of so and so. It ha it's helpful to give a brief description of it, and uh, but very often it's not necessary to give a long detailed description, but to give a brief summary of it and then a citation for methods, uh, especially ones that are commonly used. And if you've made any variations in the method, it's important to identify those uh, so it's clear to the reader. Next slide. And results, um, in, in this section, and we, we often combine results and discussion sections, but I would suggest that it's better to have them separated. And the reason is this um, is, is that it's a way to clearly identify the work that you've done and to differentiate it from work that's been done by others. And so in the results section, if you limit that to your observations and what you, what you um, measured and, and what you determined, now that's very helpful. And then when you get into the, the discussion section, you, it, you can bring in other people's works and compare and contrast your results with theirs. Um, so generally, I would say keep results and discussion set in separate sections. Next slide. And that, this is the other the point that I just made was that it's a way to dis differentiate your data from that of others. Next slide. In the discussion section, this is where you should critically evaluate your results and uh, compare them and contrast them with others and show how they agree or don't agree with other published works and provide interpretations for the reader. Sometimes manuscripts are written where it's just a description of what, what was observed without adding interpretation. And this is where the creativity of the work is really introduced, is how do you interpret the data? I mean, what does it mean? And let the, don't leave it to the reader to try to guess what, what you meant or what you think it, what it means, but, but spell it out and say, well, we think it's this. And if you're speculating, that's okay, but identify it as speculation. And you can say, this is an hypothesis, but we believe that the data supports this way of thinking. And so spend some time in the discussion of adding your own creativity, your own ideas and thoughts, so that, um, that the work becomes more scholarly when you do it that way. Next. Now, Summary and conclusions. I would suggest that you do both, both a summary and conclusions. Um, and those are two different things. A summary is just what it says. It's a summary of what was, uh, of what was done and what was observed. And then the conclusions identify clearly the things that you think were actually found or the things that advanced knowledge and then tie it back to your original problem statement, ob objectives and hypotheses. Say, okay, this was our objective. We found this and we think that it fulfilled that objective. This was our hypothesis. With what we observed, we think that hypothesis was a little bit off the mark. We would revise it to say that we believe it should be this. So something to that, that type of thing. So there you can kind of sum it up. A lot of readers will read the abstract and the, and the summary and conclusions, and that will be it. And so if you want to really get your message out, spend really good quality time on the abstract and on the summary and conclusion sections. And be sure that they are consistent with what your results showed and what, you, uh, what your interpretations were. Um, is there a next slide? Yeah. Now, this is a quote from Fred Mumpton, and it relates to the last point I made. 
The author should especially examine the part in which the objectives of the investigation are spelled out. See whether or not these objectives have been met. If they have not been met, the author should tell the reader why not, or should consider rewriting the introduction to contain a different set of objectives. All right, I think that uh, brings me to the end of the things that I wanted to say. Um, but um, I really do appreciate the effort that authors put in. I really do. And I know that it's, uh, it's not a, a, a trivial or easy matter to write a manuscript. So everything that can be done on our end to help, we're anxious to do. And then everything you can do on your end, we appreciate your doing. And we want to uh, express our appreciation to reviewers who spend a lot of time uh, reviewing manuscripts, to our associate editors who spend a lot of time trying to find people who will review. You'd be surprised on how many uh, invitations an associate editor has to send out before he can get two or he or she can get two or three reviewers who will agree to review and do a quality review. So there's a, a lot that goes into the management of a manuscript beyond its writing. And uh, but every everything that you put on paper is uh, examined by multiple people and it takes their time and effort. And so the time and effort you can put into it is much appreciated to make it the best possible. And I thank you very much for allowing me to say a few words here. And I'll turn it back to Kevin. Thank you, Joe. Thanks very much. I, I think you've covered that, that one in your previous summation. Okay, so so we just had a couple more slides to, to get through, folks, before we hand it back to Shelby. Um, so a, a few things to say to you about, about the, the business of preparing your manuscript. Uh, please go through an internal review process before submission. Uh, we'll, I think we, we agree that that's really important. And if, if, if English isn't your first language, please ask somebody for whom English is their first language to review your paper before you, you submit it to us. Um, it will save time for us. It will save time for you in, in the end. Uh, complete the online submission form carefully. Um, sometimes people gloss over some of the questions and we find out that there are answers that we needed uh, before we can proceed to publication. So, so, so do answer all of the questions fully and do we, we ask you to suggest reviewers. That's, that's really important because, you know, if, if you're working in a field that, that we're not familiar with, uh, we won't know who the best people are and uh, we, you are more likely to know them than we are, and therefore we, we would ask you to suggest them. We will find reviewers of our own as well. We, we, we never just rely on the reviewers chosen by the authors. And then wait, dot, 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 uh, you know, uh, uh, sl slightly tongue in cheek here. Uh, we, we do push these things through as quickly as we can, but we do understand sometimes that things get lost and get delayed. And, and we're happy to to hear from you if you think there's been a delay that's that's too long, but, but please do, do have some patience. Joe and I were talking about this as we were preparing our slides for, for today about language assistance. So, so I think the first thing to say is that most of the assistance that we provide on the language for your paper happens at the point of, of acceptance. Um, we, we are not in a position to adjust the language of anybody's submission pre-review. Pre uh, you, you saw how many papers we receive every year. It just, it just would not be possible financially or, or, or purely from an hours in the day point of view. So as, as Joe has said, and as I have said, it's up to the authors and their colleagues and their external uh, helpers with English as a first language to bring your manuscript to a level which is appropriate for peer review. And, and if it isn't appropriate for peer review, we'll send it back until it is. Uh, we can't ask our, our reviewers, whose time is precious, to review papers which aren't clearly written. Um, and, and I think it's it's for the journal's benefit and for your benefit if uh, it, that we do that. Um, a manuscript which has received a lot of that kind of attention before it comes to us is, is much more likely to go through the system quickly that, than one which has not received that um, that attention. I wanted to touch on a point about what, what's known in the trade as text recycling. And that is 
cutting a chunk from a previous paper of your own or a previous paper of somebody else and using it in your paper. Um, we have tools which determine whether material in your paper has been used before. Uh, one of the tools that we use is called Authenticate. It's a Springer tool. Um, and, and that will tell us if material has been published in the past. Now, we understand that in some cases, the, the, the text is likely to be the same. If it's in your method section um, and you've used this method before in another paper, well, the method is going to be similar to what you did and the language will be similar to what you did. Um, so we don't have a problem with that. And if we see a high score in Authenticate, which indicates lots of reproduction, we will look to see where that reproduction has happened. But in those areas where we expect your originality and, and, and your thoughts and your, your hypothesis, we do not expect to find a recycled text in there. Um, so, so that's just a point we'd ask you to, to keep in mind. The other thing I was trying to do was to offer for, for people who, who who haven't submitted a paper before, perhaps is what, what are the simple bits of advice in addition to all of the technical stuff we've just we've just given you, is is what what can we what can we say to you that make life a little bit easier? So so for me, I think if I was to make a suggestion and 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 Joe, it would be keep your sentences simple and short. Um, we sometimes find that that for 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 people who are trying to to convey what is a complex. Uh, hypothesis that the sentences run onto several lines of text and broken up by commas and semicolons. And by the end of it, it's really difficult to understand what it was you were trying to say. And that might be compounded by the fact that uh, some of the English that, that, uh, that's, that's been used isn't quite right. So, so short, simple sentences will really help you and will help us. Uh, we're, we're happy for you to feel free to be inspired by other authors' good writing but don't cut and paste from it, um, unless under the circumstances I just I just mentioned. Um, check the meaning of the words that you choose to use. I, I, I do have a sense sometimes that people are going to online, to an online thesaurus to look for a, a, a word and, and, you know, it comes through in the manuscript and you think, I don't think that's the right word. Um, so, so we ask you to, to use a dictionary and a translation tool as well, if necessary, to make sure that you've got the right the right word. We had uh, the word this morning that we had, Joe and I were exchanging views on a manuscript before we came here today was somebody used the word concern and actually the word they wanted to use was consider. Uh, quite different, I'm sure you'd agree. Um, the other thing that we thought would be helpful to you would be to suggest using testing your 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 text by using Google Translate. So, so if you wanted to write it in your own language and translate it and then work on that, because Google isn't brilliant, Google Translate isn't brilliant at translating uh, technical text, but it will certainly help with the non-technical text. Um, or, or do your best to write it in English and then use the Google Translate to bring it back into your own language to see what it looks like and, and maybe tweak from there. Uh, and, and as we've said several times already, if you can, please do ask a native speaker of English to read your words before you send them to us. Um, most manuscripts receive a verdict of revision of some sort. Most will receive major revision verdict. Um, that's okay, it happens and you know, you shouldn't be downhearted or despondent about that. I, I think that the trick we would ask you to do is to read in detail what's being said, what, what's being asked of you, and to deal with those points as quickly as you can. If if you think that the review the reviewer has made an incorrect point or an inappropriate point, please do say so. I mean, we're very we're very happy to hear rebuttals, and and if they're well argued, we'll put them back to the reviewers and to the associate editor to see what they say. It's uh, it's all part of the process as far as we're concerned. Uh, as, as I said, um, Joe and I put a lot of effort into manuscripts at around acceptance stage. Uh, as, as it goes off to the typesetter, you might be asked to offer some clarification. Even after all of the peer review has been done, you might still be asked to provide some clarification on the language. You might be asked to improve one or more of your figures. And this, again, this does happen to quite a lot of authors. Joe and I think this is part of the the value added service, the unique selling point that we have at, at Clays and Clay Minerals is, is this this focus on getting the presentation, your presentation, as good as it can be. And we do this work as, as quickly as we can. Uh, proofreading, we, we ask you to do that quick 
carefully and promptly. All proofreading is now done online. And, and that poses a challenge sometimes. Once upon a time, it was grab a piece of paper and a red pen and you could you could go through that comfortably. You have to provide the same amount of attention to detail and, and reading of your proof as you did when you had your red pen in hand. Uh, certainly my experience seems to be that there are fewer corrections in online proofs than there, than there used to be in, uh, in paper proofs. Um, and if, if you can manage it, get your English speaking colleague to read your work also. So one final plea about uh, your manuscript for our journal. Um, 70,000 people looked at the journal last year. Um, help to increase this number by promoting your work to colleagues. We, we talk about impact factors and citations and all of this stuff. The person who is in the best position possible to improve the number of readings and downloads and citations is you. Um, and, and we ask you to, to do that. I, I think in many cases, authors get to the acceptance stage and think, right, on to the next project, that one's done. And actually, you know, you're only about half the way there, I think. Because what you really need to do is make sure that people are hearing your work and considering it when they're writing their own work. Um, so we, we use social media, traditional media, and, and Cambridge University Press offers advice about how to do this. Um, uh, you, you can see the link down there, but but we will be putting up this video and you can get it from there. And we'll, we'll include that link in our in our links up to, uh, to Cambridge material because that's a very valuable one. At the same time, we will do likewise. We, we promote your content in um, in Elements Magazine, for example, and we promote it to our members when we send them a, a newsletter uh, every month or two. So, so we really do try and grab some attention for your work because what's important now is, is, is encouraging people to read your work. Once upon a time, what was important was getting people access to the content. I think that's less an issue these days. So that's it. Thank you very much. We're, we're about 50 minutes in, slightly longer than I thought we were going to be. We're happy to take some uh, some questions from you. Um, feel free to post them in the chat or, or, or Shelby will, will, will manage that part of the process. I'm going to shop, stop sharing my screen so we can see the questions coming through in the chat. All right. We have a question from Baba here. It says to Joan Kevin, any comment about the use of chat GBT or some more AI tools especially for improving English or readability of the manuscript. What is the journal's position about the emerging tools like OpenAI? I, I can jump in with a start on that one, if you like, Joe. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so so, so a, f a few points. I, some, somebody else asked me that question just this morning, actually. And, and I think the first thing I would say is that, you know, the essence of what we're doing here is publishing original material. Um, if we ask ChatGPT to write something for us, it's not ours, it's theirs. And I think that would be one thing I would have to say about it. Number two is that, you know, we've all seen examples of how ChatGPT can write seemingly uh, clear and relevant material, but some of it is completely wrong. And they invent references and citations and stuff like that. I'd be really wary of deploying ChatGPT for anything in this. I, I think the only ex exception I personally would make would be to say, if you take a topic and you ask GP, chat GPT to write it for you or a similar AI tool, um, and then consider it with, with your expertise and say, well, I, I don't think that's right. I think that's right. And, and it, extract from it the bits that, that improve on what you could do yourself. I think that would be acceptable, but I would keep that to a minimum. Joe? Yeah, I would agree with that, uh, but especially the point about what we're talking about here is scholarship and creativity. So that's what you, you want to display, is your own creativity. And if you can use tools like that to enhance your own creativity and to uh, improve your writing style and so forth, excellent. You know, do it, but be wary. Thanks, Baba. Okay, our next question is from Dahlia asking, is it acceptable to ask the editor about the reason for rejection of the manuscript if it is not stated? I'll answer that. Yes, it is. And hopefully we state it uh, every time, although I have to admit 
that sometimes we don't. We just have a generic statement. But um, I try to give some reason. But the reasons are sometimes fairly general, like it doesn't fit within the scope and purpose of our journal, or that we felt, felt like it was did not delve deeply enough into the topic. Uh, the, the reasons would probably be more general like that rather than very specific. Uh, usually, um, well, sometimes they're rejected just without review. So in cases like that, that would, would be the type of answer you would get. When they are rejected after review, you do get copies of the reviews. So you can read for yourself all the detailed comments of those who've looked at it. So yeah, the answer, the short answer is yes, of course. All right, does anyone else have any questions that they would like to either ask in the chat or turn on their microphone to ask? We're really interested to know what what are the things that pose the greatest difficulty for for people who are about to submit a manuscript, maybe maybe for the first time, so that we can we can prepare for that and be ready to help people who have that difficulty. So, so it doesn't matter what it is. Please just just ask, and we'll we'll, we'll try and answer it if we can. Do we have any other questions for Joe and Kevin? Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Tune in for the next next episode, huh? <laughs> yes, yes. Our our next talk will be um, Andrew Elwood Madden and Janice Bishop in early December, talking about uh, some of the grant opportunities available for students through the Clay Mineral Society and uh, how to successfully write an application for that and other grant opportunities. So. Thank you everyone for joining us for our first session and I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did. <laughs>